This response is towards Ed Jacobson, 77. Hello, Ed. While I do wish to move forward towards more blogging, I will make this my last exchange on YouTube outside announcing any more blog entries. If you have any further questions with regards to this response and wish to make another video, or even PM me, please feel free to. If it is the former, I will blog. If it is the latter, then I will return the message. For those of you who want it, the video will be embedded below in the description bar. I have taken the time to break down the objections you have in my notes into the following questions to which I will reply to. If I get wrong or miss any of your objections, please let me know. Before I answer the specific questions you lay out, I'm just going to try to answer something you left to the side, just in case. Virtual particles are contingent upon quantum vacuums. They don't literally pop into existence out of nothing. Just to clarify that point, they are contingent upon something else. With that aside, let's move on. Your first question can be summed up as, why can't the universe, which is the sum total of all contingent things, be necessary? If it is because the parts that make up the whole are contingent, it does not mean the universe itself is contingent. If one were to disagree with this, then please see Carnades.org and his illustration of the fallacy of composition. I respond by answering it thus. In my original video, I gave the example of a spider not being necessary because it was a complex thing having more than one part. It is not a thing onto itself and is thus contingent on its parts. The same would apply to the universe since it requires its parts to exist as such. Otherwise, it would not be the universe. Also consider it like this. I am contingent upon several factors. For example, I'm contingent upon my parents because they caused me to exist. However, I'm also contingent upon humanity. There is not this thing called humanity which causes me to exist, but my existence is preceded by the logical existence of humanity existing. Likewise, the existence of the universe is preceded by the fact that it is a universe, thus contingent on its parts, making it as such. The next question is, how could the ability of omnipotence be simple? Well, that's rather easy. Omnipotence is not a property God has in the same way that you have a house or you have a pretty nice hat and black shirt. Rather, omnipotence is reducible to the being of God who is ontologically simple. Ontologically simple just means made of one part and nothing else. He's irreducible and indivisible. That's also what immaterial means, by the way. It doesn't necessarily mean ethereal and ghostly. Ooh, but I digress. Essentially, God doesn't do anything in the same way me or you would. We would get up or move or exert ourselves. Rather, God does whatever he wants throughout space and time just by being as he is. He doesn't move. He is an unmoved mover. Everything else moves around him. The universe bends to his being. He doesn't necessarily command the universe to do anything or will the universe to do anything, as that would be a form of exertion. There's also a distinction I'd like to make between ontologically simple in terms of him being of one part and him being epistemically complex. We tend to think of things as parts being very complex. We see things as they are, their various properties, forms, abilities, capabilities. So it only makes sense that we fathom God in the same sense. And that's kind of the difference here. So I think our notion and understanding of omnipotence as complex is in and of itself to be what makes it seem complex to us from our perspective. Just think of primitive man believing that He's in the center of the universe and really that the earth is standing still, but everything around the earth is spiraling. The next question is, why can't God create a world with only libertarian free will and people who are saved? Without delving into the problem of evil too much, I don't accept libertarian free will. I'm actually a compatibilist myself. Rather, my basic beliefs towards this subject matter are... I use John Hicks' notion of soul-building theodicies, not to mention Leibnizian conceptions of best possible worlds where greater virtues require basic evils. The problem with delving into this too much is the fact that I need a lot of space to write out my beliefs and premises and ideas. I promise to devote a blog post later on discussing this problem right after I get a few other things out of the way. The next thing you inquire is why is there an abrupt shift from it to he? Well, the reason I personalize God is necessarily because I'm a Christian. In Christian theology, God did become man. And if you want a thing on the incarnation, 
that's going to take a while to parse out. And again, I'll devote another blog entry because apparently one philosopher on the net, Dan Fink, brought up this very problem with quote-unquote sophisticated theologians. Now, I know it might seem like I'm trying to ditch out of this, but believe me, there is an answer. I usually like to source uh, Thomas Aquinas. Eleanor Stump is a brilliant source on this one. Um, if I can find any other sources, the links will be below. Although I would just like to point out the fact that I'm just defending natural theology here, not any particular revealed theology. If you want to call God he, she, or it, please be my guest. Don't even bother with the incarnation if you don't want to. That's not where the argument is meant to lead you. The next question is, how can something personal be simple when humans are so complicated? Humans are complicated in an ontological sense, that's very true. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's where we draw our personhood from. Rather, God is likened to us in the fact that he is pure intellect. In the same way we can understand abstract objects, they can exist within our minds such as numbers, shapes, the forms, things of that nature, temporarily. So, so do they exist eternally within the mind of God. A lot of Christians took Platonistic ideas and just merged them together into one simple form known as God's mind because it's easier to believe in one form called the mind or the intellect as opposed to just believing a lot of forms exist independently out there by themselves. Plus, this would kind of step around Russell's paradox. Bertrand Russell, by the way, was a British philosopher who asked, what is the sum total of all sets? Sets are just rows of numbers. For example, positive integers, negative integers, integers, prime numbers, odd numbers, even numbers, all the like. And he asked, okay, how about the sum total of sets? Is the sum total of all sets in itself a set? If it's a yes, the sum total of all sets is a set, then that would essentially mean that it belongs with the rest of the sets because it itself is a set. However, if that's not the case, then what is it? On my worldview, I could easily answer that the set of all sets would just be the sum total of patterns present within the mind of God. The next thing he did was kind of push me to watch and review Noel Plum's thing on evil as a privation. Um, here's the problem. Noel Plum gets it seriously wrong he confuses privation with negation, and he also confuses what morality is in a certain context, or as it pertains to humans. In Noel Plum's universe, the problem isn't privation, the problem is negation. The universe has a lot of stuff that's missing, or not there. The universe itself isn't privade of anything that robs it of its kind of universeness, where it kind of falls short of being a universe, like a failed universe. Rather, it's just one where a lot of negation is is taking place. Evil is not a negation of something. Evil is a prevasion. A prevasion, unlike a negation, isn't when something is missing. It's just when something is corrupted or when the way that something is sustained isn't really coming full to its potential. A universe, empty or otherwise, is still a universe. A human such as Hitler, on the other hand, whose essential values are corrupted because instead of being someone who is resolute to tell the truth all the time, he was a liar. And instead of being a peacemaker, he was a warmonger. These things require a goodness to take place and a goodness to be corrupted. That's the main difference in Noel Plum's main arguments. The next question is, how is this not human characteristics reflected onto God? Well, first of all, if this is correct, then it would be God's characteristics reflected onto humans. Just saying. But I think this question does deserve a little more attention. Well, first of all, I would say that if we were to concede that the whole of all essence would exist in one simple form, then I think it would only be obvious to make a comparison in that idea because the human mind is the only other thing we know of where forms exist in. And objects as well. Trees, Patrinus, I would say, is an Aristotelian. However, the main problem is they only hold one conception of form, whereas the human mind holds quite a bit more. With regards to the philosophy of mind, I'm not a substance dualist, I'm a hylomorphist. I'll give you a link that describes that a whole lot better, but I really hope this does start off an interesting exchange. I'm really sorry it was late coming out, the video that is, I had a lot on my plate. I hope you received this well, and I know your questions aren't completely going to be filled or changed with this one 10 minute video, but I hope this further dialogue helps you illustrate why I believe in what I believe. Thanks for listening, Ed. I really appreciate this. Just sorry I'd had to wait a couple of months. My blog's at the bottom. Click for more.